Get your popcorn ready. It's game time, baby. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a team that is known as Stoppers. Stoppers. The Athletic presents Hogan Fishman. Every single play, go take it. Bring that juice. Let's go get it. Come on. Chicago's best Bears coverage. Go Bears. Go Bears. From NBC Sports Chicago. It's Adam Hogue. I, I think he's going to go down as one of the best players of all time. I'm talking like maybe Mount Rushmore of NFL players. From The Athletic. Kevin Fishing. There's no better day to join the podcast than Mitch Trubisky Day. Do you still call him Mitchell Hogue? Is that like a, is that a you thing? Now, here they are, Adam Hogue and Kevin Fishing. Hogue and Fishbane with you today on the Hogan Johns podcast. Adam Johns is off this week. So our guy, the fish man, the fish dad, whatever you want to call him, he is he. And he's ready to talk about Northwestern, as always. Hey, the Northwestern softball team off to a great start. Baseball team mashing home runs. Okay, I was, referring, I was referring to the first round pick in my mock draft. Let's do it. Let's get right into it. All right. Uh, we're not going to leave with that. We're going to talk with. We're going to start with some quarterback stuff, uh, but we will get to the latest mock draft that's up on NBCSportsChicago.com. You mean I wrote, pick wasn't Peyton Ramsey? Was not Peyton Ramsey. He did not make even the uh, last six round pick. Wow. Um, you know, I got to say, going through a mock draft and doing four six round picks is exhausting and also feels like a complete waste of time because what's the over or under on how many of those picks get get traded? Yeah, at least one and a half, right? Yeah, they're not going to have four sixth round picks. Um, they could trade all four of them, for all we know. For Trevor Lawrence, yes, seems realistic. Uh, but you can follow us on Twitter at Adam Hogue, H O G E at K Fishbane, and uh, you can still follow Adam Johns. I don't think he's going to tweet much this week, but he's at Adam Johns on Twitter. And uh, Kevin, also, uh, you should be reading him at the Athletic, theathletic.com slash Hogan Johns is where you go to subscribe. And he is, uh, he has a piece up on the Bears quarterback history, which is always fun to read about. We're going to discuss that uh, here, specifically when it comes to the draft. Uh, this week, so make sure you check that out. Uh, and you should be subscribed to our YouTube channel. Uh, just go to youtube.com, your YouTube app, whatever you do, search Hogan Johns. You can find the channel and subscribe. If you do that, you can see Kevin Fishbane's outstanding White Sox hat that he is wearing today, uh, and my Hogan Johns t shirt as well, which you can buy on uh, obviousshirts.com. And those are still there for you. I think we might have a new one coming out soon, too. So stay tuned for that. We will keep you posted. Okay, uh, with all those particulars out of the way, there was some quarterback news in the NFL yesterday. Uh, doesn't really have a whole lot to do with the Bears other than it's another big quarterback trade that went down. When I say big quarterback trade, it just seems like so many of these guys are just sort of being passed around from team to team, and they don't really move the needle all that much, which is kind of like the Bears signing Andy Dalton, right? It's just the guy moving from one team to the other. And uh, you could just keep going through the same list of teams that don't really have their answer at quarterback. And it's another top three pick that didn't work yeah. out. You know, it, uh, so you, Sam and, Darnold, of course, is what we're talking about. Yes. Being traded to the Panthers. So in a two and a half month span, we've seen Jared Goff, Matthew Stafford. Um, Stafford's in a different category, but he was move but so Jared Goff Carson Wentz Mitch Trubisky Sam Darnold are all on new teams um and yeah I mean that just look teams that just don't have the patience level anymore to you know and and they're and they're also savvy enough to get something for these guys as opposed to just you know well you don't want to be in a Jacksonville situation where you give Blake Bortles a ton of money and then and then you're stuck so you know the, these teams are realizing when they're done they're done and they move on and get draft picks and I guess Hogue, from a Bears perspective, I, I mean, I guess Sam Darnold was an option, has always been an option. I, I, me, I would rather pay Andy Dalton $10 million than have to figure out what to do with Sam Darnold's fifth-year option and give up all those draft picks. I mean, it wasn't a ton of draft capital, per se, but it's still a decent amount of picks for a guy who was pretty bad last year. So I, I, don't, I guess my question then is, would you have considered Sam Darnold instead of Nick Foles 
like, like that that to me might be part of the equation like is there a way is, is that the way you could have brought someone like that in but again i think it's just too expensive for what he is you're saying wait how are you saying sam darnold's in for nick Foles? like you could trade nick Foles to the jets for oh. Sam Darnold, so that way your backup quarterback, like if Andy Dalton doesn't work out, at least you have a 23 year old former top three pick to work. You know, because I, I a couple weeks ago I brought up the Gardner Minshew idea. Yeah, this you know trade Foles or trade a late pick to the Jaguars for Minshew and have him be your backup because at least it's somebody who you know you could like maybe develop into something one day. Um, Darnold's way different, obviously, because of the contract situation. Um, so I, you know, I guess I'm, as I'm saying this, I'm realizing you're not going to pay Darnold what he's owed to be a number two, but I, I'm just trying to figure out it, was there a scenario in which the bears were to, could have brought him in and should they have, uh, well, well, first of all, I have never going back to the, now granted the bears were one year in a Trubisky when Darnold was being drafted. So it's not like they're really in the market for a quarterback, but I, I have never sensed at any point that the Bears have ever been high on Sam Darnold. So it, it just never seemed like um, something to me that was very much an option. Now, did they look into it? Maybe. Maybe they did. Um, what was it? It was a six-rounder this year. In the second, second and fourth, fourth next year, I believe. So what's interesting about that is this is the second trade that's gone down, second quarterback trade that's been go that's gone down this year, this offseason, with a top three overall pick in which, based on what was reported, there's really only one team bidding. Right. And yet, the team that traded the quarterback still got a decent amount back, even though it wasn't really a high high bidding war. I mean, the same, you know, Carson Wentz, the Eagles probably are going to have a first-round pick from that trade next year. And yet, at the end of the day, the Bears didn't offer. It seemed like it was just the Colts. And in this case, it seemed like it was just the Panthers trying to get Sam Darnold. So I guess I'm a little surprised that the Jets got what they got. Yeah, and I, I guess if you're the Jets, I mean, could you have held out until you drafted Zach Wilson and then, you know, hope? I mean, I hate to say this as a hope thing, but sometimes these franchises just hope a starter gets hurt somewhere. You have like a Sam Bradford situation with Philadelphia and Minnesota from 2017 but that that's a total shot in the dark because then you're i mean if that doesn't happen anywhere you're just saddled with the guy so i guess these teams i mean that's what they can do they can wait till august and see if he's available but so maybe the jets were holding out for that and, and that's why they they were able to get the extra pick out of it um i don't know, i mean if, if you're carolina like i don't see a huge problem with it i mean i i though i was kind of excited to see carolina draft a quarterback and, and they still could certainly but you're Matt Rule, your second year head coach. You've got a new owner there. I can't imagine that there is a lot of excitement of all the resources they put into Teddy Bridgewater and are now putting into Sam Darnold, as opposed to potentially having, you know, I don't know if they, you know, Trey Lance or Justin Fields. Well, this is where I think there's a connection to the Bears potentially. And I just find this trade very interesting, the timing of it yesterday, um, you know, just a few weeks before the draft. To me, it signals one of two things, and they're kind of opposite things, right? So it's one, we're going to have five quarterbacks go so early that the Panthers didn't even feel like they can get one of them. Or it's that they only feel like there's only three, like, real franchise quarterbacks and maybe that goes in line with what the 49ers did just to get to number three knowing that they obviously they feel like there's three that they're willing to take however it shakes out i think the big question mark is that is that mac jones or is that justin fields um so i just find that interesting because if it's the second one i brought up in which maybe some teams aren't as high on trey lance for example, as I've somewhat hinted at here for a couple months now, mainly just from the standpoint that I just feel like some people are underrating the impact that him not playing last year and really not having a whole lot of experience under his belt. Um, what, kind, what kind of impact that, that that can have on draft night? I don't know how you feel about it, Kevin. I, 
I tend to think that there's still going to be one of those quarterbacks available at number eight. And the fact that the Panthers have already said, nope, we're rolling with Sam Darnold. I wonder if that's an indication that maybe like a guy like Trey Lance is going to end up falling into the teens. Yeah, it's a great point um, because yeah, it does seem like you're going to have these three or four guys. I mean, it, it, it looks like they're going to go quarterbacks one through four because I think I still think Atlanta could draft a quarterback. They'll get a new GM there. You know, Matt Ryan's not going to be there forever. Might be only there for another year or two. Um, like, it, it, like I think we've learned this with the Bears, right? When you have a top five pick, and there's a there's a quarterback there who you think can be the franchise quarterback. I mean, you got to take him. You know, no matter what's going on with with who you have on your roster, I think you got to. I mean, obviously there are certain exceptions to that. So, yeah, I mean that's the the Broncos and the Patriots. So there are the factors here, right? In terms, especially in terms of guy, teams in front of the Bears. Is yep. what do they do? And it certainly seems like Denver has been poking around quarterbacks. We know New England could be interested here, and here's an opportunity for Belichick to get the next guy who, 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 who he really likes. So, you know, from a bears perspective, I, I, th- I still think you got to jump in front of those two um, if you're interested, but yeah, you, you, this could be a scenario where somebody is, is going to slide because yeah, I, I know I, I think I saw Daniel Jeremiah's mock draft had five going the first seven picks today. And you know, look, that could happen. We've seen this happen with quarterbacks before, but you're right that this, this could raise an alarm bell that one of these guys is going to fall into the teens. And that's where, you know, puts Ryan Pace on the, uh, you know, under the spotlight here in terms of, you know, how antsy does he get if he likes one of these guys? And Because the other thing, too, you look at what the Panthers gave up for Sam Darnold. I also wonder if they would have had to give up more draft capital to get to the number four pick. Oh, I'm sure. Right, if that's something they're considering. You look at what the 49ers gave up and then think about what the Bears would have to give up to get to number four or to get up anywhere. I mean, it's a lot. You're talking about future first round picks. So, you know, they got their only hope really is that one of these guys drops. Yeah, except they were willing to give up what they were going to give up for Russell Wilson. So to me, like it's still always somewhat on the table. And if uh, there was that Adam Schefter tweet this morning that uh, the Falcons are interested in trading. And uh, although it's funny, I read that tweet as uh so I think I don't have the tweet in front of me, but he said teams have called they're interested in trading that pick. And I immediately, I immediately read that as not enough teams have called and we want people to know that this pick is for sale. Yeah. And I also, our, our Atlanta Falcons writers, the athletic kind of poked fun at it too, because do you really think that the Atlanta front office was sitting there yesterday, saw the trade and was like, Oh my goodness, the jets are going to take a quarterback at number two. Right. We've like, We've got to start talking to teams. We got to start figuring out what to do. I mean, they like they, they've been these, these talks have been happening for months. I think it's just a, a timing situation that you, you you put that tweet out there. And yeah, and then I saw another thing: the Lions are, are talking about maybe a quarterback at seven, which also could mean the Lions are pick is for sale. If anybody wants to go up to number seven and take that pick, um, you know, these teams are all talking to. Um, they're all looking at Denver. I think. I think that's the team now that it's you know new GM. Uh, a, a head coach Henry his third year, a team president that has struck out on multiple quarterbacks. Like, here's your chance to, to, to trade up and get a, get a guy and start over. Yeah. So uh, there will be competition. I, I Until I see otherwise, I am keeping the Bears in that conversation as a, as a possible trade-up team. I just still find it hard to believe that they're just rolling with Andy Dalton. However... Uh, we do have to plan for other scenarios, right? And so that's what I do in my four mock drafts leading up to the NFL draft, my four Bears mock drafts, and try to go through s- different scenarios. So the first one I did back a couple months ago was actually that scenario I was just talking about, which is a scenario where if Trey Lance falls. Now, I don't really simulate trades, but it was more so to just show the possibility of what happens if the Bears do end up with a quarterback in the first round. Uh Mock draft 2.0, I went with an offensive tackle, Christian Darisaw, which a lot of people have been talking about, and is certainly on the table. And then in 3.0 today, I don't necessarily think this is likely, but I do think it's a scenario that needs to be played out just in case. It's, uh, you know, the since free agency, things have changed. They move on from Kyle Fuller, and I don't necessarily think that they view cornerback as a pressing need, but they 
don't have a ton of depth there, if we're being honest. And they have a hole in the slot at the nickelback position right now. So I can't rule out them looking at corner. And I also wouldn't completely rule out them looking at an edge rusher in the first round, too. Other than those two defensive positions, I don't know how you feel, Kev. I, I don't it would shock me if they did anything else. Defensive line, it's not a great D line draft. Um inside backer. Just they just drafted Roquan a couple years ago, not in an enough position. Strong safety, not in important enough position when you have Eddie Jackson. You've seen the way that they've tackled that position in free agency. So I think if they go defense, and I don't really even expect them to go defense, but if they do, I look at corner and I look at the edge rusher position. Yeah, well, look, you mentioned they don't have a slot corner right now. And and that's someone that's gonna play 70% of the time. I mean, that, that's essentially a starter. Um, that they don't have. Uh, I, I know Ryan Pace said some nice things about Kendall Vildor, and I'd love to know the true evaluation of him from the front office, from Sean Desai, from Deshae Townsend, because that is an important factor in all this. And can he play inside? I think that was something they said he could do, but we haven't seen it. Um, you know, Duke Shelley got his reps there, but you know, like you, you, I, you can't roll into 2021 and say Duke Shelley's our starting nickel. So I, I, I mean, I'm slightly biased for Greg Newsom. Northwestern corner who you put there at number 20 a, a little bit um but I mean look the, the dude can ball he uh, you, you saw it up close in person uh he took on every challenge and he has that corner mentality uh and, and I think he certainly has the skills to play in the slot I mean you know Pat Fitzgerald talked about you know they would trust him on an island he'd file the top follow the best receiver I always tell people watch the Purdue tape uh, when he went up against uh with Bell David Bell, Bell? yeah yeah uh, and, and, and Bell got his, don't get me wrong, but I think there were some ticky tack calls on Newsom um, in that game. That, I mean, that's still an outstanding tape that he put together. That It night. really was like you watch that game. You're like, there, that is an NFL corner. That is a top, you know, that, that's one of the, for, uh, an early round corner. Then you saw what he did his pro day. It's like, OK, he answered the athleticism questions, the speed. Um, so, I, look, I, I think, you know, and Johns and I wrote about this last week and we talked about these premium positions, right? The, these positions that the Bears have have kind of ignored a little bit in terms of putting draft capital in them. And, and they finally did last year with Jalen Johnson. And, and, and I think Newsom, like you just Desmond Trufant, I, I think they're happy they got him. You just don't know what you're going to get from Trufant at this stage in his career. It's a one year deal. I mean, you, you, cornerbacks, one of those positions you, you got to reload every year. Yeah, I remember. Hogue, 2014, we were all kind of scratching our heads when they took Kyle Fuller at first. And then you kind of, you, you, you ask yourself, you're like, wait a second, that they need three corners. You need three yeah. starting cornerbacks uh, in the NFL. And then obviously Tillman goes down and Fuller comes in and, and, and the rest is history. So, um, you know, here we are again. Uh, I, I think it's a bit, it might be slightly a luxury pick when you look at some of the other things on the table. But yeah, you, Greg Newsom, you, you step him in there as a day one starter at slot corner. I mean, it makes your defense a whole lot better. And they may like Kendall Vildor. I don't necessarily think that they view him as a slot corner, though. Um, and so I, I just feel like this this solves your... Newsom, to me, is a guy that can play right away in the slot and then end up outside whenever you need that. To, and maybe that's by week three. You know, Maybe Desmond Trufant's hurt. You don't... Kendall Vildor is not really that great, and uh, you slide him out there then. But, or it could be next year, you know, if that does work out. Don't forget, Artie Burns is still in the mix, right? So... You have some options on the outside. I don't see a ton of options on the inside. And um, and so that's where, I don't know, just a thought. Again, I don't necessarily see them going defense in the first round, but I, I do think that that scenario needs to play out. So move from the first round to the second round. And then this is where, and I think this is a conversation that's worth having as we go back to the quarterback conversation. If they're not going to end up with one of these top five guys, how do they address the quarterback position later in the draft? And you have some guys like Davis Mills from Stanford, Kellen Mom from Texas A&M. Don't know that I'm necessarily sold on either of these guys, but you might have to overdraft them if you want to get them because the quarterbacks are always on a different draft. And the way I look at Davis Mills, and I watched a lot of his tape uh, over the last few days because I was really impressed with his pro day, but that's a pro day. And it's great that he threw in the rain and he looked awesome in the rain, but that does not simulate game-like situations. And so I watched a lot of the tape, and there's a, still a lot to be desired there. Uh, now, he doesn't have a ton of experience. He was a, a high-profile quarterback recruit that had some bad luck. 
Um, but eventually did push KJ Costello out of there in the transfer and did improve as this season went along. So you can make the argument that Davis Mills from Stanford is a guy that's starting to come into his own a little bit and maybe with some NFL coaching and better pieces around him can have some success. So I probably see more of like a third or fourth round grade on him, maybe a third when it's all said and done. But I think you might have to draft him in the second round if you really want to do that. So that's why I put him with my second round pick. You know, I, I like Davis Mills, and, and I think you read the scouting reports about the way you know his, his his top strengths are the way he reads defenses, and you think about what Matt Nagy wants and has wanted in his offense, and you think, okay, that that makes sense. Like the guy might not have the rocket arm or the, the amazing athleticism, um, you know, but but if he can if he can if he can operate Matt Nagy's offense the way Matt Nagy wants, maybe that's what this team has been lacking. I think your mock draft talk shows you the problem Ryan Pace is going to have. And, and I've done this when I've been doing these mock exercises is the gap between their third round pick and their fifth round pick is yeah. so vast. And that's why we talked about those sixes. Like you got to try to find a way to get in the fourth. But he, once you get out of once you get to day three, everything's out the window. You're throwing darts. And, and when you look at quarterback and offensive tackle. Um, and, and maybe receiver and corner and edge like those again, back to the five premium positions. Like, I just think it's going to be so hard for them to go into day three and not have attacked those positions with their first three picks in some way. Um, and that's why I think I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you about taking a quarterback in round two. And I wonder what you think about the fact because John Z's talked about, you know, do they want to take a guy who doesn't have a whole lot of college experience after what happened with Trubisky? I, I, I think Ryan Pace and, I'm going to get hammered for this. I think he's smart enough to not let the Trubisky thing impact his scouting. I think he can't. I, 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 it's such an easy thing for him to say, I'm not going to fall for that again. But these are every quarterback's different. And I think if he looks at Davis Mills and looks at the tape and says, this guy's got it, I don't think he can say, well, I drafted that Mitch Trubisky guy without a whole lot of starting spirits. Look what happened. I wonder, Hogue, back to the original thing I was wondering, is it does it help Davis Mills to not have a lot of tape to where it could hurt Kellen Mond and Kyle Trask, but they do have a lot of tape, especially Mond. I mean, Mond was a four-year starter, and nobody's talking about him in the first round. I think Dane, I think our guy Dane Brugger might have him ranked ninth among quarterbacks. I mean, the thing that it, to your point, the thing that I don't like about Mond is the last two years. You're like, all right, this is going to be the breakout guy this year. You know, he's going to jump into the Heisman conversation. He's going to take he's going to take his game to the next level. And it didn't really happen. You know, it, it, it's not a big enough an, a, a ascension for me. I mean, I think sometimes we forget that these guys are entering college at the age of 18, sometimes even 17. So they're still really young. They should be improving when they're in college. Uh, I look at a guy like Steven Montez last year from Colorado, who I remember watching as a freshman there. I'm like, this dude has a cannon. He is going to be a first round pick. And then a couple of years later, he was the same guy. He never got better. And so last year, I think I put him in one mock draft in the seventh round, and that was it because it was like, all right, he's got a big arm. Maybe you take a flyer late, but he's not really uh, a real starting quarterback prospect at the NFL level. So I I, I mean, I, I guess to answer your question, it would only hurt Davis Mills if he had the tape and he didn't improve. I, I guess what I like <laughs> right. about his limited tape is I do see improvement from the beginning even of 2020 or the tape last year uh, to the end of the season. Well, I'm making almost the NBA argument, right? Like yeah. th when a guy's in college till his senior year, it's a bit of an issue sometimes as opposed to you see the freshman with all those skills. And you, again, it's different, but, but I do see like the intrigue there with Davis Mills. And, but I, I just come back to like, how can the bears go into Saturday without a quarterback? Like, I just don't know yeah. if they can really afford to do that with, with their situation. And so that's why, I mean, I, mean, I want to do more research on Davis Mills, Kalamon, Kyle Trask. I think these are the, I think those are probably the three main guys. Jamie Newman seems like a, a mystery a, a little bit at this point. I'm not, I'm not, to me, he'd be more enthralled. of a day three flyer. Yeah. And then, of course, you have Peyton Ramsey for one of those six round picks. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm not going to go through all these picks. You can check it out at NBCSportsChicago.com. The only thing I will bring up is my third round pick. So if you're not going to address tackle in the first two rounds, when do you address tackle? Do you address tackle? Um, I think what you're going to be left, even though this is a deep class, I mean, if you're waiting till the third round, I think you're going to end up having to draft a little bit on traits 
and development. You do have an offensive line coach who's known for development. Juan Castillo working with guys. So uh, there's this tackle out of Northern Iowa who's really interesting to me, and that's Spencer Brown. He's 6'9", 314. Nice. He, he looks like an enormous tight end is what he looks like. But, yeah, and uh, he had he a moved. good senior bowl. Yes, he yeah. did. And that's where he first came on my radar, um, mainly because not only do I not normally watch FCS football, but they did not even have a season this year. Um, so another guy who's limited tape, although he has played a little bit more in his career. Now he's more of a right tackle. He can move. He moves more like a tight end, even though he's huge. Sometimes I get worried about these guys being too tall, but he does manage to get leverage uh, low to the ground despite being that tall. Technique's kind of a mess. He needs to be wor- you know, he needs to be kind of reinvented a little bit, but he has the tools and the traits. So this is the type of guy I think you're looking at if you wait till the third round to address the offensive line, where he's probably not gonna be ready to start week one. You're probably still gonna be rolling with Charles Leno and Jermaine Effetti, which I think is okay. I just think you need to have a, somebody in the pipeline that you're working to to eventually step in there. Well, you know, the the Bears they have this decent situation at tackle. They have Leno, they have a Fetty, they bring in Elijah Wilkinson from Denver. So again, it allows them to be patient. And we could say the same thing about corner. They bring in True Font. They have Jalen Johnson. I, I still could see them bringing in a veteran nickel at some point just to have that guy. Um, you know, again, they they don't have to rush somebody in. We already know the quarterback situation. That's why I come back to receiver a lot because yeah. they don't have. I mean, look, if if Anthony Miller's can get moved at some point, th- they don't have a number three receiver. So. You know, like that's that's a spot where you could have somebody that could step in right away. But yeah, as you said, I, I I do think they gotta get a tackle in one of these spots. It seems like they've been very you know, Juan Castillo's been at a bunch of these pro days. Uh and I don't like to put it too loud. I don't put stock Hogan, and you know this about me in like meetings with teams, but I do think it's important when position coaches are there, because then they can see these guys in person and they can get at least get a good evaluation. We don't know we won't know what Juan Castillo thinks about these guys he's seeing in person, but at least you know, we, we know he's there and, and they're, they're putting in kind of the due diligence of that position.
Um, all right. Well, I'll let you. Uh, I'll let the listeners check out the rest of that at NBCSportsChicago.com. We want to talk a little bit about something you wrote too this week and worked on, uh, which was the the glorious Bears history of drafting quarterbacks. Yeah, I'm going to read you um, one of the comments here, Hogue, that I think really speaks to what I was kind of maybe not aiming for, but really proud of as a writer um, that I got this comment uh, from Matt D. I initially decided not to read this article, but after careful consideration, I realized that as a lifelong Bears fan, I do hate myself enough to read it. Yeah. And look, it was not my intent to make people angry, but I just felt like because we said the Bears are in this position where I feel like they have to draft a quarterback. And I've I've criticized Ryan Pace often for not taking quarterbacks during his time. And, and I mentioned in here the story of 2016. You had three fourth round picks and you took all three of those guys before Dak Prescott. Yeah, that, that one hurts. So and there have been other times uh, in, in Bears history where this happened. They went in the early when, when Wanstead got here, they went years without drafting any quarterback. That included taking Todd Sauerbrunn a few picks before Cordell Stewart went off the board. Um, the 80s, you know, after Jim McMahon and, and, you know, with his durability issues, it took a while before they went and, and went after Jim Harbaugh, which was an aggressive move at the time that Mike Ditka hated. He hated that they did yeah. that. So it was an interesting thing to go back through. You know, it's just like, it's amazing too that the same team that traded up for Mitch Trubisky instead of Deshaun Watson, Patrick Mahomes, lost a coin toss for Otto Graham, lost a coin toss for Terry Bradshaw, had spent months preparing to draft Joe Montana in the third round. At the last second, Jim Finks changed his mind and took a running back. Like you go through this, you know, they took Bob Williams one pick before Y8 Tittle. Like, it's just amazing <laughs> that this organization, you have to hear, and, and here was one of my biggest uh, revelations from this, Hogue. Kyle Orton might have been one of the best Bears draft picks because he's exactly why you take those chances on, in, in, in the middle rounds. You, you take him, even though you had Rex Grossman, you took Kyle Orton, he ends up starting as a rookie because Rex gets hurt. He's pretty good. You got the quarterback competition. He ends up being a solid quarterback, not great, but good enough. And then you can trade him for Jay Cutler. You know, again, that's the dream. It doesn't happen very often. A year before they drafted Kyle Orton, they drafted Craig Krenzel. And we all saw how that worked out. So, and we've seen plenty of these guys in mid-round. Nathan Enderley, Dan Lefevre are more late-round picks. So I get it when you go to that later round, you're totally throwing darts. But at least Kyle Orton, you, you gave yourself a chance with somebody. And, and Ryan Pace hasn't done that with this team and um, since he's been here. Phil Emery didn't do it. You know, he drafted David Fales like reluctantly in 2014 um so yeah so folks can um you know hate read that at the athletic and, and go through the 80 years from from luckman to trubisky and and again i think it's interesting to see the parallels um by general manager and how they treated the position and, and certain times they were totally fine taking quarterback when they didn't need one and that just has not been the case with this front office well, a couple of things. I mean, first of all, I think uh, our listeners probably relate uh, to, with the idea of uh, they hate themselves just enough to listen to the pain in this podcast, right? Maybe that's a t-shirt. There you I go. Hate, I hate myself just enough to listen. Um, so, I, hey, that's just the situation of being a Paris fan right now. And it was a good piece uh, and very interesting to read. But, I, I you know, to your point, I, I you'll hear teams tell you or – analysts talk about well once you get to the third round or whatever there's a significant drop off in hit rate with quarterbacks well that applies to every position every you, single position I, I mean that's not a good enough excuse to me you take swings because and you're great kyle orton's a perfect example wasn't a great quarterback was decent could start games for you and you were able to flip him for somebody else now that guy didn't work out either but he was a big piece that trade doesn't happen without kyle orton um and you know, if you don't take swings, you have no chance of getting Kyle Orton or Kirk Cousins or yep. Dak Prescott or Russell you, Wilson or Russell Wilson. You take the swings, you at least have a chance to get one of those guys. And maybe only one every four years lands as a starter. And a couple of them turn into legitimate superstars like Wilson or Prescott. But again, you don't take the chance. You got zero percent chance of getting them. You take yep. the swing, yep. you, it might be a low percentage, but I don't know that it's much lower than some of these other swings that the Bears take on other positions. You know, some of them hit, some of them don't. Darnell Mooney hits. 
And the Bears are probably one of the better teams at hitting on some of these day three guys over the last few years and most teams. So I feel like that might all, you know, but like it just, yeah, you're right. Like if it's the fourth or fifth round and you have a pretty equal percentage of a guy hitting, like why, and you, and you could use a young quarterback to develop. Also, I come back to, you have Matt Nagy. Like you have talked this guy up as a quarterback guru and to not afford him the opportunity. And now I think, Matt Nagy, somebody brought this up as a comment, and it's a fair point. It, it, you would think that if Matt Nagy wanted somebody, the Bears would have brought him in at some point, like an undrafted rookie or or, or a late round pick. Like you would think yeah. that that would have happened. So I think the head coach might deserve some some blame there. But you know, so much of this organization the past years, from well, twenty seventeen to twenty nineteen, understandably, everything is about Mitch, and I, I can kind of see not bringing in a rookie there because you didn't want to mess around with that but last year was a perfect opportunity to just take somebody and i don't think any of them i don't think any of the guys have been good necessarily and they might never play but at least but again you, you have to take the shot at some point um and, and yeah so that story kind of goes through the times the bears didn't take the shot and of course times that they did and uh it did not work out whoops sometimes they drafted good boy sid luckman was good they drafted him that was a long time ago. Um, all right. Last thing we need to touch on before we get out of here, because uh, I've rightly taken some criticism on Twitter for this. We have yet to bring up the new Mighty Ducks series. Um, I have not watched it yet. I don't blame you. I watched one episode yesterday with my son, finally. I've uh, been extremely busy with many different things. Uh, so not exactly a time of year I can digest a Disney Plus series. But... Um, Interesting first episode. I'm a little confused on why Gordon Bombay hates hockey all of a sudden again. Did he hate hockey again in D3? Am I missing that? I think he did. And he hated it in the first one too. Right? Well, that's what I mean. Like he, I yeah. remember the beginning he did, but that was because he had a traumatic experience of, you know, missing the post or hitting right. the post a quarter inch the wrong way. I think I brought this up when we first talked about this. Is this kind of like when this, when the new star Wars came out, and the the uh, the first of the new Star Wars was really just um, a New Hope, but just with different characters. Like it was like the same kind of plot yeah. line. And and like I, I I'm fine with nostalgia, so I was into that. And like this is what right? My it's the same general plot line. Right? Well, I'm not gonna lie, the music got me jacked up. You oh, know? There you go. Yeah, there there's some. Uh, and and sure enough, there's Gordon Bombay with like uh, you know some some coaching points in the first episode. I don't want to ruin anything, but I was a little confused on why all of a sudden he owns this like mm-hmm. random crappy ice rink in the middle of I don't even know if it's St. Paul or Minneapolis. They don't make that clear, but one of the two twin cities. And um, he hates hockey again. So maybe I need to go back and watch D three again to figure that out. But it just was like a weird. Uh, don't watch. Don't watch D three again. Yeah. Right. Just watch D two. All right. Well, I'm going to give this series a chance. I'm probably going to watch it slower than I did Ted Lasso, but we'll get did there. Did you see the Entertainment Weekly cover with like the four, the my the actors from my the original Maya Ducks? I did. Yeah. Some of them looked exactly the same, and then some of them did look a lot older. <laughs> well, that's because they're a lot older. Yeah. No. <laughs> look, look, and I've made I I am happy to poke fun at my own losing my hair on this podcast often, but yeah, you, know, you see some of those guys and like whoa. All right. I, I feel you, Averman. Yeah. I know what that's like. All right. Uh, we need to get out of here, but appreciate Kevin pinch hitting today. Uh, and that's uh, this will be our only episode of this week. Johnsy will be back next week. We will dive full into the draft. We are getting closer and closer, so we will continue the draft conversation. Hopefully get you some interviews coming up here as well. Probably need to check in with Dane Brugler here soon. Uh, as we get closer to the draft, not like he has anything important coming up, uh, but we'll make some time for that. So uh, check out all the coverage on The Athletic, theathletic.com slash Hogan Johns is where you go to subscribe. We appreciate you doing that. You can read me at NBCSportsChicago.com. Check out the YouTube page, Hogan Johns on YouTube. You can watch us. It's fun. Some people consume their podcasts that way, so you can do that if you want. And uh, check out ObviousShirts.com for the T-shirts. They're still out there. And again, I believe we have a new one coming. I was trying to get clarification on that today. So uh, check it out. And uh, we appreciate all the support from all of our listeners. Harass Johnsy a little bit for missing this week. How dare he take a week off? You're not allowed to do that. Do you think he's listening? No way. Not a chance.
no chance. Uh, but we appreciate you guys for listening. And thanks again, Kev, for, for pinch hitting today. We will uh, talk to you next week.